Welcome to A History of Health in Hull, a series of webinars starting with prehistory before events were recorded down to now. This is a series overview explaining how we'll tell a story for each of seven eras. We're focused on Hull, but this story strikes a chord in any city that has experienced rapid population growth, industrialization, and urbanization, and of course, all the health issues that follow. My name's Rob Bell, writer and voice of the series. More on my background in a moment. Brought up in Hull in the UK, I was educated at the Marist, now St Mary's College, and the universities of St Andrews and Oxford. This is where my interest in history took root. My working life has been in logistics and has taken me to over 30 countries, often on projects related to ports, their roots, heritage and futures. And my interests coincide when I consider ports and everything passing through, not just cargoes, but disease. As each port grew, more people, more crowded living space, health concerns, challenging working conditions, solutions needed. Hull, a port city, brings all these strands together. These webinars started to take shape during wide-ranging discussions with Dr Dan Roper, then the chair of the NHS CCG and a Hull-based GP with an ethnographic sense of medicine within the community. Dan will join me to discuss the series on podcasts to follow. We'd worked on a dementia project together, taking films and stories into residential care homes, and therefore a special thanks to Hugh Pym, BBC's health editor, who supported this and other health-related issues. On local detail, the whole Medical Society's archive has been a useful resource. And finally, we'd like to mention the late and much-missed Paul Jackson, once lay chair of the Hull NHS CCG, his legacy is in this story and in the launch of the hugely successful St Mary's College Medical, Health and Social Care Academy. Above all, the webinars are open to all, for students and the curious. So, who are these webinars for? Historians, students of health. In 2017, Hull was the UK's city of culture. Over 3,000 people from all walks of life ended up in all shades of blue to take part in Spencer Tunick's spectacular Sea of Hull artwork. A bit like these webinars, open to all, but no need for the paint. More seriously, there will be facts and insights that are new to some and known to others. This series can't compete with the experts, but it can signpost everyone to explore further as needed. We'll cover the timeline in two series. First series, we set the scene before Hull becomes a city and close with the run-up to the launch of the NHS in 1949. A second series will continue the story from 1949 into the future. Now for a whistle-stop tour of what you can expect from each of the seven webinars, each one around 30 minutes long, divided into three sections. Webinar 1, Estuary Matters from Prehistory to Port City of 1299. This is a satellite photograph of the Humber Estuary. It was taken in 2013, one of astronaut Chris Hadfield's favourite images of Earth. The great French historian and founder of the Annales School of Historical Research once made the point that history is what people make of their geography. During this series, we'll see, to paraphrase Brodel, that maybe even more so, health is how people cope with their geography. To start this series off, and before we leap into a string of epidemiological events, plagues, epidemics and pandemics, we need to consider the context in which we and our ancestors have lived. What bearing, if any, has this had on our health and well-being? Back in prehistory, the topography around the Humber estuary gave us a water level of 0.7 metres higher than it is now. And let's not forget that much of the East Riding is several metres below sea level even today. At the end of the 14th century, in the summoner's tale of the Canterbury Tales, Geoffrey Chaucer refers to a merci country called Holdernessa. 
Prehistory is not full of clues as to the nature of living in these lowlands, but the map to the right highlights an eastern seaboard lying between East Yorkshire and Romney Marshes, constituting an English lowlands, a region characterised by large areas of marsh and fen and a distinct culture born out of the constant risk of flood and storm surge. As we shall see in the webinar, there are some shocks in this part of the story. Mosquitoes in Cottingham, poets dying from malaria. More on this later. Webinar 2 brings us to Edward I and the purchase of the settlement of Wyke from the Cistercians at Meuse. Edward, the Hammer of the Scots, saw Hull as a strategic asset to supply his armies against the Scots. Wyke had been stagnating after its big breakthrough when Meuse became the logistics hub for wool from all Cistercian monasteries of Yorkshire. This was because of the ransom needed for Richard the Lionheart, captured on his way back from crusade and that was one year's wool from the cistercian monasteries sent over to pay 1st of april 1299 the royal charter hull's birth certificate was signed the history of health in hull begins this webinar is dominated by the black death which hit europe from around 1349 to 1354, as the map illustrates. The population of Europe reduced by around 60%, and England's fell from close to 5 million down to under 2. Here, we expand the discussion beyond disease. With a huge labour shortage, we explore innovation and how this impacted a wider European context. Webinar 3 sees Hull grow in population, expand its port facilities and more black swans. That's unexpected events with great impact. This period marks wave after wave of plagues. 1537, 1575 again, then 1602. This was when Shakespeare had to close the Globe Theatre in London, a bit like the Covid lockdowns. 1631, Hull Fair was cancelled. And from 1650 to 1750, burials exceeded births every year in England. This is the period when population starts to increase. The North Wall gives way to the first major dock and the infirmary is built, in fact, with other fine Georgian houses built on Albion Street nearby, we can see the beginnings of a medical quarter in Hull. Webinar 4. Demography and Growing Pains, 1775 to 1880. This is where being a port city makes a difference to the health agenda. Industrialization brings with it rapid urbanization, and in whole terms this meant overcrowding and insanitary conditions. Port cities are characterized by trade and people flows. There's also the opportunity for disease. For example, the images on the screen put the city under a microscope. Hull witnessed and had to cope with typhus, cholera in the 1840s, scarlatina in the 1880s, the Russian flu in the 1890s. During this period in London, major breakthroughs in sanitary improvements are triggered by the work of John Snow, who links the pump to the transmission of disease, and Edwin Chadwick. These figures and their work are well known. However, Hull, like many other cities, had their heroes. Sir Henry Cooper and the Irishman, Dr Owen Daly and Edward Francis Collins, editor of the Hull Advertiser, all forced the public health issue time and time again. We cover this in detail. Webinar 5, Industrialization and a Golden Era, 1880 to 1914. Many of Hull's major municipal buildings were constructed during this era. The port was expanded with the opening of Alexandra and King George docks to the east, and the population, which had been around 20,000 in 1800, grows to over 200,000 by 1900 and over 300,000 by 1931. And then in this era, over 3.2 million transmigrants moved through Hull from Europe in search of freedom and opportunity here or in the Americas. All this growth and transit was a recipe for disease if preventive measures 
were not in place. The whole South African War Memorial stands in Paragon Square to this day and was unveiled on the 5th of November 1904. It commemorates those soldiers from Hull who died during the South African Boer War of 1899 to 1902. We mention this as a litmus test of the state of the nation's health in 1900, and the picture is not good. During the war, the British Army experienced great difficulty in finding fit young men to recruit as soldiers. Before men could join the army, they had to pass a medical inspection. It was discovered through these medical inspections that 40 to 60 percent of volunteers were unfit for military service. In some towns, none were fit. The Fitzroy report on physical deterioration highlighted urban overcrowding, pollution, parental neglect, and with remarkable exceptionalism, the incompetence of mothers. This report offers a very different perspective on this land of hope and glory. Britain was losing ground to other nations industrially, and this was further compromised by productivity and health. We move to webinar six, World War I and the Spanish flu, 1914 to 1919, and a shift from war on horseback to one on an unprecedented industrial scale. As firepower increased, multiple ways of dying follow. Medicine had to respond. Hull's own Smith & Nephews became the default provider of bandages, the start of their international wound management business. The triage system was introduced on the battlefield to speed up response and plastic surgery became a huge advance in treatment. And yet, aside of all the cemeteries and those missing in action, no one will ever know the mental impact on those who survived the battles and also those waiting at home. Another dimension to our need for innovative healthcare. And just as the armistice was agreed, the Spanish flu affecting one-third of the world's population and causing over 50 million deaths. In comparison, World War I had claimed 20 million dead and 21 million wounded. And on the bottom right, we have Sir Mark Sykes, a local MP, who'd played a major role in the peace negotiations in 1919 to die of Spanish flu before Versailles was over and whose body was exhumed in 2008 to analyse the DNA of Spanish flu itself. And webinar seven, the last in the first series, Home for Heroes and the Interwar Years into World War II and the Foundation of the NHS. A crowded period, we see a shift in attitudes. War and its impact triggered huge advances in medicine. And healthy eating, inspired by growing our own during wartime itself, was a major contribution. World War II brings with it the whole blitz. More than 1,200 people killed, 3,000 injured, over 152,000 became homeless, and the blitz flattened 27 churches and 92,000 homes across the city. A stark reminder of what many communities across our world today are dealing with. And then, after the war was over, the move to create that National Health Service. When we consider the reports that highlighted just how unfit for service men were for the Boer War, then again the First World War, and again for the Second World War, when we consider the challenges of disease causation and how best to cure these ills, the need for more focus on prevention becomes ever more significant. Series 1 of A History of Health in Hull closes with the NHS. In 2012, London hosted the Olympic Games. The opening and closing ceremonies broke new ground. Instead of military-style pageantry on a huge scale, Danny Boyle told the story of Britain's industrialisation. Some would say that London was the height of the UK's soft power, where creativity in the arts, music and industrialisation was well expressed. And the crowning glory was a piece on the creation of the NHS itself in 1949. 
In our second series of this History of Health in Hull from prehistory down to now, we will pick up the story from the creation of the NHS in 1949. We'll then explore developments, challenges and what the future looks like. That story comes later. Enough said. You've been listening to Rob Bell giving an overview of the webinar series, A History of Health in Hull. Do please visit the Rob J. Bell webinar site, subscribe and like. Thanks for listening.